Welcome to the Marketing Mentor Podcast with Elise Benham, founder of Marketing-Mentor.com and author of seven books, including The Creative Professional's Guide to Money. Since 2008, Elise has been interviewing her clients and other successful professional creatives who are doing what it takes to stop the feast or famine syndrome, get better clients, and command the fees they deserve, and sharing the nuts and bolts of what they've learned so you can do it too. You can find more at Marketing-Mentor.com. And now, here's Elise Bennett. Do you get good phone or do you avoid the phone completely? I know that a lot of people prefer email and text lately and that not many even answer the phone unless they know exactly who's calling and about what. Nonetheless, I do think it's a viable marketing tool if you want to connect directly with your best prospects and let them know there's another human being over here. I tell you this because I do it and I'm reaching people even though I admit that it is more challenging than it used to be. Still, it's worth it. And who better to discuss it with than someone who also does it regularly? Michael E. Stern of buildabetterphotograph.com. This is Elise Benin of marketing-mentor.com. And this is the third podcast in what is turning into a nice little series with Michael, who is very eager to give back and share what he's learned after 36 years and counting as a commercial photographer turned time-lapse filmmaker. In today's conversation, he shares the bad experience that triggered this topic, his proven ideas for how to give good phone, and the specific techniques he uses to secure big, expensive projects. Listen, and then try it for yourself, if you dare. Hello there, Michael. Are you there? I am, Elise. Good morning. How are you? Good. Welcome to the podcast. It's good to be back. And this is our third podcast, and we may just keep doing them because there's a lot to talk about, and I really do think you have some good ideas and some good perspective and some really interesting metaphors. So (laughs) today we are here to talk about the art of the sale and giving good phone. Am I right? Yes, pardon me. I was taking a drink of water. Yes. Uh, Learning how to give good phone is really crucial as part of the package of presenting yourself as a viable professional, one worthy of being hired. And let's just define our terms a little bit here because a lot of people are afraid of the phone. I think millennials also more and more seem to not be interested in using the phone And we're talking about, are we talking about cold calling? Are we talking about just getting someone on the phone because email can really complicate things and take much longer than if you just resolve a question or a problem on the phone quickly? What kind of phone are we talking about? Well, we're talking about two kinds. One where you're uh, trying to establish a relationship, i.e. the cold call, and one where you have an ongoing relationship. And uh, before I define those terms, let me comment on your, ter- your, your idea about millennials texting. If they're relying on that as their primary form of communication business, they're all going to have very short careers. So uh, what, what prompted this idea when I uh, spoke with you about recording this was uh, last week or a week and a half ago, I was having breakfast with a, with a longtime friend and we were walking out of the restaurant. And my phone rang. I didn't recognize the number, so I picked up. And it was this woman who was trying to sell me on financial services. And she did everything wrong she could possibly do to turn me off, where I was absolutely not receptive to the idea. And that's what prompted uh, me to come up with this uh, idea for the talk today. So what she didn't, what she didn't do, she didn't ask me if I had time to talk, if this was a good time. That's one of the first things I do when I'm cold calling somebody after I identify who I am and what I wanted to do with this phone call. I ask them if it's a good time to talk and it gives them an out 
to say, hey, I'm busy or I'm not interested. It's a gracious, graceful way for them to exit the phone call. I don't lose any face. But the good clients appreciate you respecting their time. So and, I always ask if it's a good time to talk. And let me ask you then, is that the very first thing you say? Or do you say, hello, this is Michael E. Stern, and something about who you are so they can decide if it's a good time to talk? Yes, to yes. I introduce, I introduce myself by name and what I do. And then I ask them if they have time to talk. So it gives them a few seconds to process. Okay. Uh, she, this uh, woman, she is not a native English speaker, meaning her enunciation, her accent, and her pronunciation of words was very difficult to hear on a cell phone, in a car, with an intermittent connection. So the, the, the environment that she was making the cold call from was in a noisy car. It was a cell phone, so the connection was spotty. And then she did... English is not her native tongue. So all of these things, not asking me if I had time to talk, pitching a cold prospect, an idea of financial services in a bad environment with a bad connection, all those things led up to, I am not interested, honey, and do not call back. So she was either poorly trained, inexperienced, or incompetent, or all three. However that played out, whatever mix she was of all of those, uh, she she had zero chance of this thing ever getting past this initial phone call. It maybe lasted 30 seconds, and then that was it. Uh, so uh, it's very important when I make my phone calls, I'm in my office, I turn off uh, my email, I unplug my landline, I make sure there's nothing playing on the computer that might ding or make noise. I want zero distractions. I want to listen. I want to be an active listener and listen to what that person is saying, how they're responding. I have a certain cadence and pitch, and if there is hesitation in their voice or they seem like they're having a bad day because they're a bro whatever it is, I'm trying to listen exactly to how they're responding to me. And sometimes... If I'm concerned that my cell phone may have an intermittent connection, I'll use my landline, my hard line, which is a great reason to have one if you're in sales. You don't want, hello, I'm sorry, could you say it again? I couldn't quite hear you. If your prospect says that to you on the phone, you have a bad connection, it kills the flow of the conversation. Right. Uh, now, also, oh, you, go ahead. before you go on, though, because um, mm -hmm. we're making a lot of assumptions here. And the biggest one and the one I hear about most often is nobody answers their phone. And mm -hmm. so why should I be calling in the first place? And you, it was interesting when you said, I didn't recognize the number, so I picked it up. I answered mm -hmm. most people, so from what I understand, I'm not this way myself, but when they don't recognize the number, don't pick up. Right. Well, the only numbers I don't pick up are numbers that have toll-free prefixes, 888 or 800, because that's someone trying to sell me. But any other number coming in could be somebody trying to reach me for business, wanting to buy from me, not sell to me. Right. So as a self-employed self person, I always have to pick up. But... To, to, to go back to your point, normally I'm calling people inside companies. And I usually have to go through the corporate number to get transferred to the person. So one of my techniques, and I'm going to reveal a big one here because it works like crazy. The person that answers the phone is the gatekeeper, and their job is to keep you from getting where you want to go not really providing you information. They're trying to protect the people's time in sales and marketing and new business development. But when I call, if they're laughing, if it sounds like, you know, someone just walked by and said something funny and that person was laughing, or, or especially if they're laughing or giggling, the first thing I'll say is, I love that joke. That is so funny. It's one of my favorite jokes. And it completely catches that person off guard that's answered the phone. And then I can start chatting with them, tell them who I am, what I want, and they will always send me right to the right person. But and how, so I'll often, get a, how often are they laughing when they pick up? Mm, about a third of the time. Really? Yes. 
Uh, so the other thing is they, they tend to be very professional and polite. And if they sound like they're older, like middle 50s and up, 60s and up, they appreciate politeness and respect. So if I'm polite and respect and tell them who I am and what I want, 80% of the time they will send me directly to the right person. There are times when you call up and you can tell the person answering the phone is probably in a minimum wage job. They're probably not very happy with the job they're doing. And perhaps they don't sound terribly educated or well-trained because of the way they answer the phone. Yeah, uh-huh, what do you want? You know, people that answer the phone like that, who are the receptionists, you're probably not going to get very far. So when you when you're really tuned in to what the person on the other end of the line first says, or how the volume in their voice is, or if they're laughing, or if they feel light, I mean, you know that when you talk to people, if you really think about it, that's the first clue I have of how I'm going to approach the next thing that comes out of my mouth. So I have to focus. I have to focus on what they're saying and how they're saying it and the language they use and how they enunciate and pronounce and all that. Okay, so what's interesting to me about that is that, you know, when people do what we're calling cold calls or even warm calls or calls that are following up a warm email message, I mean, there's so many different techniques one could be using. Yes. But in general, True. the common denominator is that you're so, you hate to do it in the first place, you don't really want to be doing it, and you're so focused on what you're supposed to say that you're not listening. Most people are not listening for mm -hmm. the clues and the cues that are very subtle. What you're describing is very subtle. It and is. requires a little bit of guessing also. Uh, you know, it's an educated guess backed by years of experience and thousands of phone calls. Also, I go to a lot of networking events and I meet people for the first time. And usually these people in networking events are in stressful situations. They have to be there to meet people, to try to develop business. Their boss said they had to be there, whatever it is. Or they're just generally happy people. There's a whole gamut. And I look in their faces. I look in their eyes as I shake their hand. And I, how, what comes out of their mouth, I can connect the visual of their face with what comes out of their mouth. So when I do cold callings in the future and I hear that kind of voice again, I focus on that face and it gives me a mental picture of possibly what that person is like. And I feel like I'm in a one-on-one -on -one conversation face-to-face -face with them. There's a little bit of role playing, a little bit of pretend, but I'm on 100% commission. Every person who works for themselves is on 100% commission, but it's never about the commission. I put the person first, because if I don't, my guaranteed commission is 0%. So I've had to train myself to connect voices and tone with faces in person. So then when I don't have the face, I can still sort of understand what that person is like that I'm talking to. It's interesting to me, Michael, because you are a photographer. I am. And that's what your career has been all about. And I find it interesting that you're taking pictures in your mind when you're networking and then showing yourself those pictures when you're making phone calls. I hadn't thought of it that way. It's such an automatic thing for me now. But you're right, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I do have a bit of a photographic memory. Uh, you know, it, certain th things stick in my mind, which is why I don't watch horror films. <laughs> I don't want to see those visuals, although I'm a big fan of Walking Dead, but that's another story. <laughs> okay. Doesn't make any sense. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> All right. So go back then to your uh, suggestions for, you know, when people are committed to making these calls and uh, getting mm -hmm. through and, and uh, establishing relationships. Well, you have to know what kind of a talker you are. Uh, I am a person that likes to walk around and wave my hands or fiddle with something when I talk. So on certain calls, I'm on the cell phone and I'm outside my office walking around. I, ha I live on a sort of a compound with a main house and a studio and an office and a nice big yard. And so I will walk around in my yard while I'm talking with somebody because the garden that I spend a lot of time in 
really supports me emotionally, if that makes any sense. So I want to be in a good environment when I'm talking, and I need to be walking and moving when I'm talking. There are times, of course, when I'm sitting and making notes as well. But I, have, I understand what I need to be in what physical state I need to be in to be really good at listening and giving back the right feedback to the prospect. I always speak with a smile on my face. I'm smiling when I talk. I think that translates into you don't bite off the end of your words. You perhaps speak a little slower. You, you hit all the syllables and the words. I'm speaking with a smile on my face. And I'm also an active listener. I take notes. When they're answering my questions, it's important to them that they're answering. And if I don't write down and get exactly down, write down what they've said, then I've wasted everybody's time. And I'm always trying to understand if they're happy, stressed, rude, uninformed, just poor speakers, whatever it is, I'm trying to categorize them, identify, profile them, for lack of a better word, so I can respond in a way that allows the conversation to keep going forward. Uh, it, it it's also, not always it's not always successful. <laughs> and it also sounds like in order to profile them, you have to not take anything personally, right? If they're abrupt, yes. you have to yes. you have to tell yourself it's not about you. It's exactly you don't know what just happened to them before they began speaking to you. They had could have had a fight with their significant other. The car could have died for the third time in a week. The boss just yelled at them. They didn't get the raise they wanted. The baby threw up on his favorite tie. You know, you don't know what stuff they're bringing to the conversation. Most, the, the good people that you want to work with don't bring that to the conversation. They get it. But there are ones, you know, you got to kiss a lot of toes before you find the princes, right? So you're going to you're going to plow through a lot of people that are just a waste of time, but you don't know they're a waste of time. Initially, you've got to work them a little bit and understand that there's a possibility of getting to the next phone call. And actually, um, I would like to wrap up with that idea. That's a good segue, because the question that I hear often is, you know, what are realistic expectations for this type of outreach? And how can you tell if someone is a waste of time, if you, especially if you can't get through? Well, 80% of all sales are made after the fifth phone call. And there are people that think 80% of the sales are made after the 10th phone call. Uh, half of the people make one phone call and give up. 25% call twice and quit. And you, you work that down to really 10% of the people, of 100% of the people that begin calling, 90% are going to drop out by the fourth attempt. So the field is wide open if you're willing to put in five or six or seven phone calls. And maybe you mix that with some emails. Generally speaking, I give people three phone calls and three emails, and then I'm done with them. And I, and I usually, and this may be completely arrogant on my part, and I'll own that if that's what you want to label it, but on the last attempt, I will say, you know, I really wanted to speak with you. It, it seemed like we had that good initial conversation. I was hoping that we could talk about some projects, but I have to say that I'm not going to call you again. I just have to put my time elsewhere. So thank you and good luck, and if you want to reach out to me, please do so. And I'll end it like that. And it's pretty bold, but I want them to know I've decided you're no longer worth my time. And maybe it gets them to rethink, well, you know what, maybe I'll try this guy later. Or, and maybe they initially, they, they do want to reach out, but they're just too busy. You know, there's all kinds of reasons why it doesn't work out. Uh, but I, uh, I, I pretty much seven times because I, I just have to move on to the next person. And my uh, opinion and recommendation in that situation, I don't have a particular number. I like the idea of three phone calls and three emails. But then if this is a company or a person that you think is a really good fit, I 
would put them on auto drip with some kind of email newsletter mm -hmm. with or without their permission. Truthfully, I will say that. Yeah. You know, I, I've thought about doing an email newsletter. I have enough of a database now to do that. Uh, but the thought of adding that to my list of work, you know, with the blog and the work I do and the networking, and I, I'm not, I, I really would have to turn it over to, to a professional to do a newsletter. Uh, and it's a huge responsibility that I'm not ready to take on yet. And I don't really feel the need, but I understand. Yes. You know, sometimes I will, when I've told someone I'm going to bail on them, maybe, uh, you know, I'll calendar it for six months out to try to reach out again to see if maybe maybe that person is no longer in the job or maybe something just hit their desk and this would be a good time to talk. So I, I, it's rare that I write somebody completely and totally off, but you know that initial phone call, then follow up with an email with links, and then maybe you meet them at a networking event because I'm in a very specific niche category of construction time-lapse films. So the networking events are the, the people there are usually people I've talked to on the phone or sent emails to. So I go there so that they make another connection to me. And it's a process. It used to be so easy to sell. You could get a person on the phone the first try, and usually by the end of the phone call, you'd have a job from them. And that ship sailed back in the early 90s. Right. So it's really been a struggle to get people's attention. And you... You may hate talking on the phone, but unless you have a sales rep, you've got to do it. Be confident in the product you have and you're selling. And practice yourself by calling customer service at the bank and the cable company and the cell phone company that provides your service. Call their customer service every once in a while. Listen to how they talk and, and have a conversation with them and be a little bit unreasonable. <laughs> and see how they respond and take notes. <laughs> All right, Michael, give people the URL where they can find you and your materials online. Well, the URL is buildabetterphotograph.com, and they can find some information about me. Some of my blog posts might be of interest, but that's my, that's my web hub, buildabetterphotograph.com. Beautiful. And we've also done a couple other podcasts, which, which can be found on the Marketing Mentor podcast stream, and we'll link to them. So thank you, Michael, and uh, until next time. Okay, Elise, it's always great to speak with you. Take care, everybody. Thanks again to Michael E. Stern for sharing how he's learned to thrive as a right-brainer in a left-brain world. You can find his site, at buildabetterphotograph.com. You can also listen to the first two podcast interviews we did, one on his pricing strategies and another on how choosing his niche has given him the freedom he wanted for his life and his business. This is Elise Benin of marketing-mentor.com. And if you like what you hear and want more, go to the website and sign up for my quick tips and special deals. And I'll be back again soon. Thanks for listening. Now, go try out what you've learned. If you like what you hear, you can go to marketing-mentor.com and sign up for Elise's quick tips from Marketing Mentor and her free 30-minute mentoring session to get your burning questions answered. Check out what's on sale in the Marketing Mentor shop, like the Pick a Niche Kit, Proposal Bundles for Designers and Copywriters, and the 30 Minutes a Day Marketing Plan. Elise is also the host of the How Design Live podcast, a programming partner for How Design Live, the largest design conference, and you can learn all about that at howdesignlive.com. Until next time.